the Purpose Driven Entrepreneur Podcast. We're all about delivering great content, thoughtful discussions, and tips and tricks to help you truly get the most out of your life and business. And here's your charismatic host, me, Matt Brown. Welcome back. I'm so glad to be back with you again. Hope you're having a good day. Hope you're having a good week. Uh, Today is always a special day. In fact, every day at the podcast is a special day because I get to hang out with you, which is so much fun. You know, I was listening to uh, another podcast I listen to oftentimes, uh, uh, Amy Porterfield. She has a phenomenal podcast uh, all about online marketing. So shout out to Amy if you listen to this one. Uh, This is for you. Uh, She had mentioned, you know, no matter what the downloads are, right, whether I have an audience of hundreds, thousands, millions, I don't have that many yet, but whatever it is, you know, if you had, say, 500 people listen to you, She said, consider if you had a room full of 500 people tuning in and sitting down to hear and listen to you chat and to have a conversation with you. I think, well, that's really, really amazing. So I just imagine every time I sit down to do this episode, I look at every single one of you in the eye. And I know a lot of you actually know because we've interacted, you've tweeted me or uh, we interact on Facebook or you've been to my live events. So I know who you are. So I just want to say, hey, hello. And I'm glad to see you, glad to hear you again. Um, And hopefully you're glad to hear me too. So without too much uh, rumblings around this week, it's been a good week so far. Uh, I'm recording this on a Tuesday. And this week has been uh, busy like always, but a little bit mellow as well. Uh, there is a lot going on as far as uh, my book is moving forward. So I'm going to give you some more updates as we get closer. I don't know if I told you already, but my book is completely written and finished. It's in proofreading right now. Uh, I'm working on some endorsement, uh, uh, author blurbs and endorsements right for the back cover. We're just going through the cover design for the second rendition, and it's going to be coming out for you to check out the Firebox Principle. The seven, well, what do we want to call this? See, we're, we're, I'm finalizing right now. <laughs> I love this part. Uh, this is this is the authentic side of, of right? I'm going to tell you exactly what's going on with me. So we are finalizing right now the exact subtitle. I believe we're going with the firebox principle. Subtitle is the seven drives fuel every entrepreneur. I'm curious though, what do you think? Um, comment or, you know, again, find me on Facebook at Matt Browning and, and message me or comment, let me know. Um, the other option was something around like the, and, uh, the seven drives that fuel every entrepreneur movement, entrepreneurial movement, or the seven drives that fuel every entrepreneur spirit. Um, I kind of like just the seven drives that fuel every entrepreneur. It makes it personal and it's about you. So I'm just curious what your take is. If you if you want to um, chat me up and let me know what you like, what you don't like, uh, I'd be glad to hear it. All right, let's get into the podcast this week. This week, I'm going to be doing another long form interview that uh, I am so, so, I was looking forward to this for a long time. And I finally got this person to, uh, to come on and be on the podcast. Um, she is an amazing, amazing person from the entertainment business has, uh, she's worked on movies, everything from, uh, Dune was her first movie. If you saw the movie Dune back in the day, uh, man, what a, just a classic, classic movie. And she worked on Dune. She's been on working on Ghostbusters. She's worked on, uh, where else am I looking? Uh, yeah, Ghostbusters was a huge thing as a puppeteer. She worked on the State Puff Marshmallow Man. Um, she played the the demon dogs uh, at the Temple of Zool in um, in Ghostbusters. She has done the Foster Farms chickens uh, in the old commercials. If you've seen those, she's also been a puppeteer with Jim Henson for decades, as well as a Disney Imagineer. So she is the one who is uh, personally responsible for creating uh, Splash Mountain. Uh, um, what's the other, uh, Big Thunder Mountain for Disney Paris. So when Disney Paris came out just a few years back, a few years, I mean, it's been a while now, um, she was the one that was hired to go in and run the entire project and design uh, the, the the look, the feel, everything that was made, uh, the, the foam work. She talks about all these different kinds of work it was. So uh, my guess is Terry Harden this week. And Terry has, again, just an incredible story. We spend a lot of time talking about growing up. She had um, some really hard times. Shockingly, a lot of these visionaries and artists that I'm interviewing here have had some really hard and interesting times. Specifically, though, she was growing up in a time um, 
she was born in 1957. So she was growing up in a time where her, her father's African American, her mom's white, and she was one of the only mixed kids really in the entire area, especially in her school. She recounts uh, a story, a time where, you know, she'd have to, she'd go to the drinking fountain and her father would have to drink from one and she'd have to drink from the other one because she looked white, but they weren't quite sure what she was. Um, Some just absolutely heart-wrenching stories that, to me, I want to hear these things because sometimes we forget how far we've actually come, right, as a society and as people, and I want to hear these stories, and know what's happening. You know, she's had some bullying and just horrendous stories from from uh, as a child, but ultimately, as she overcame that, she came to a place where, from from the very beginning, she just wanted to create. And you know, she was making uh, homemade Wookies after Star Wars, and she talks about how she got into making puppets, making costumes, creating all of her own stuff all at home. And that landed her on her very first Hollywood uh, film, which was working for creating all of the suits for the movie Dune. And and from there, they introduced her to some other places. And before you know it, she's on Ghostbusters. And then she's getting in with Disney. She meets Jim Henson. Um, oh, my gosh. On, on Ghostbusters, she has an awesome, awesome story um, about how she was getting razzed and teased by Dan Aykroyd and um, uh, Bill Murray. Man, those are those are two super funny guys. I love their stuff on SNL. I realize it's 2018, but if you have not, if you have not gone back and watched some seventies and eighties SNL, I mean, it is just off the chain. So, um, we have some awesome stories there. Um, you really get a chance to get inside this artist's brain. Who's really, who's been able to make a career, um, as an artist. Um, she talks about, she's also, uh, worked on the dinosaurs TV show, both Flintstones movies, uh, produced by, uh, Steven Spielberg and her first interaction with Steven Spielberg and what he said and what that was like. Cause that was a very, very intense moment. So all this and more on the episode, get ready, strap in. We're gonna have an awesome time with Miss Terry Harden. So here we are. Yeah. I am finally sitting down. You you're in Morro Bay. I'm in orange County. Um, I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. Actually, since I first met you, uh, we were, we were in the, one of the masterminds I attend. We're in the same mastermind together. And I saw you chat, uh, have like a five minutes or 10 minutes to talk about what you had done and who you are. And I, I, I fell in love with two things. I fell in love with like your character and your heart. Um, I love who you are. You're just one of the sweetest, kindest, I hope this comes out right. Almost like innocent, like just amazing hearted person and pure. That's the word I'm looking for. You're very pure. And then yet you've spent so much time in the entertainment business and Hollywood and uh, around theme parks, around all this stuff that you just don't run across that often. So I just wanted to say it's a, it's an honor. It's a pleasure. Um, I'm very excited to be sitting down with you. Um, how is your day going, Terry? Thank you, Matt. That is a nice, that's one of the nicest things anyone has ever said. And I really appreciate that. The day is going great. I'm here in Morro Bay. My husband has taken me for my birthday because we, my birthday's June 21st, but uh, we push it up just a little bit so that we could spend it together because life has been a little hectic. So we're having this nice, comfy uh, relaxation time here in a very quiet place. I like to be near the water. I love that. Are you getting a few <laughs> days away or how long are you staying? Yeah, I'm a couple of days away. We'll go back maybe tomorrow or, you know, we'll go back, back soon. Back to I, I mean, LA. I want to. As long as I can talk him into staying here, I'll stay for a little while. Yeah, long. why not? Just move the whole business <laughs> up there. Back to the grind in LA. That's so, it. So you have, uh, you have a ton of stuff happening, a ton of things that have been happening. Um, I, I, I think you probably have the same thing. I struggle to, we were just talking about this before we went to tape. Uh, I struggled to, to describe and explain to people who you are um, because you are like an enigma. You're so many things and you, and you have so much creativity inside you. Um, but I, I love one of the things you said earlier was you always been an artist that would also speak and you've really been working on um, in this latter few years becoming the speaker uh, who speaks and teaches uh, who is an artist and you have so much artistry. I want to get to some of that um, and I want to hear uh, some of your story. That's kind of what we do here. Um, but is, was that pretty accurate? Is that what you're really going after nowadays? That's absolutely accurate. That's absolutely accurate. Cause as an artist, I have a lot of, I will have commissions and things like that, but I've realized that there are people out there that really want to know how they can either make a living doing what they love, which I've done since I was eight 
or how to use creativity in their business to, you know, take it to that next level. And the thing is, is that many don't think that their business is creative or why should I have creativity or mm -hmm. even that they're an artist. Right. So, yeah. So I'm sitting here saying that's, you know, artist is not just limited to um, the fine arts. Just because you're not a painter, just because you're not a sculptor, just because you don't draw, that doesn't mean you're not an artist. Because quite frankly, and I'm sure you will agree with this, Matt, mm -hmm. I have a CPA and I have a bookkeeper who are maestros in their business. Sure. Okay? I suck at being... <laughs> <laughs> forget it. If you have me paint with numbers, you can just forget it because it's not going to happen, which is why I have delegated to these two people who I believe they're working with numbers is an absolute art. And yet people will tell you an accountant is one of the most dull jobs in the world, but there are accountants out there that this is their love. This is their life. So what is the actual guess? Uh, what's the actual definition of an artist? Well, it's someone who's passionate. At whatever they do right yeah and look if, if you've seen the movie the accountant with ben affleck i mean i don't think anyone's gonna think that accounting is dull man i uh <laughs> edgier seat like i feel like that's every is every accountant like that that's amazing just forensic accountants i love that i love <laughs> that movie so much wasn't it great yeah, yeah. And, and you uh you, you've been you're no stranger to film so i want to hit a couple of things so one you said you've you, you've been grace to be able to do the thing you love to do since you were eight years old mm -hmm. so what, what did you start doing at eight years old well my parents both my parents well my mother's very artistic so I used mm -hmm. to sit next to her while she painted oh, she was cool. number one watercolor artist but her parents squelched that passion they mm -hmm. believed that being an artist meant broke it doesn't they believed that she would be nothing but miserable yeah and when you're passionate and someone keeps you from your passion, even if they mean well, this is going to be devastating for you. You, you. you may not think it is, but it still lies deep within your belly. And uh, so my mom, as, as a result, it was so killed in her that to this day, she doesn't, she doesn't do any of that. And she said that I just don't have what it takes to do to follow my passion anymore, oh. but I'll be doggone if my kids are going to be the same. So Terry, if you want to be a garbage collector, you go for it. So at eight years old, I read a good housekeeping article about gingerbread houses yes. and decided to do this for my friends and made 145 gingerbread houses. <laughs> at, eight, at eight years old. At eight, in custom boxes. So. <laughs> I, I don't even know what to say about that. I was thinking, so I, I have a seven-year-old Val and, and he's an amazing kid, but. I'm just imagining in my mind to get through one gingerbread house together at Christmas. We do that every year and it's a blast, but man, I, I, I can't even fathom a year later, right? Going through multiple, let alone, so you're, you're doing these custom gingerbread houses, custom boxes, and, and did you sell them or did you give them away to friends? Well, or what, some, what you... some people got, that's why it got exciting because I did it for my friends and then other people said, well, can I buy them? And I was like, yeah, but you know, you're young. So you're kind of like, well, what yeah. do I sell them for? Well, the box. Sure, two dollars. Yeah, I think I sold them. cents. I think I sold them for twenty bucks or something like that. And they they were they started out really ugly. You know, they looked yeah. like you know because I baked them and used the sugar and I and they were Flintstone houses. And oh my, my gosh. Like, oh, honey, nobody's gonna. Oh yeah, you know, trying to. I said, wait, wait, wait. I'm not done yet. Yeah. And, and we decorated them. And then I had my whole family decorating them. And after they were done, they were exquisite. They easily could have sold for five times what I did. Wow. I was just happy to get them sold and people were happy to get them. So that is so that's incredible. how it started. That's how it, it ignited is follow your passion and it usually will lead to something good. That's amazing. Now, w were there other things you started getting into? Because I remember I never thought of myself as an entrepreneur per se as a kid, but as I was looking back and I'm doing a lot of the interviews and um, I've heard a lot of people talking about how, oh, you know, my first venture was when I was however old and I never realized it. But I remember looking back now and I was probably about like 10 or 11 maybe. 
and I was standing, I, I went to the corner. I didn't have a lemonade stand, but I was getting into skateboarding with friends. Mm-hmm. And somehow I got a hold of all these uh, extra, they were like the old eighties vision skateboards that were like okay. kind of like the teardrop shape were wider and had like front bumpers and rear bumpers and little side rail guards and stuff. Uh, and the, the big wheels, not the little ones. So I had this bucket of wheels and extra trucks and all this stuff. And I'm standing on the corner and we made like a skateboard accessory shop. Um, I think I sold, it was like four wheels for a dollar and I probably sold like, you know, two of those. So I might've made about two bucks from it. But looking back, I remember, man, like that was really interesting. I took something that I was really into and thought I've always had that mind. I realized of someone else probably would get, be into this too. Like, how can I, I almost think like entrepreneurship and what we do is a lot more around wrapping people around a vision of what's possible, bringing them into this vision that you have and helping them to share it. And then like the sale or the, you know, the buying the gingerbread house or the, the um, skateboard wheels or whatever is, is the second part. That's the fruit of it. Right. But it's all about like, did you always find it easy to like capture people's attention or capture their imagination in what you were envisioning? So when you had a creative idea or were you more of like the lone artist when you went off to your room and created on your own and maybe later on you started bringing people into it. What was that like for you? Well, Matt, let me just point out that what you said about your skateboard wheels is exactly mm. what starts it. Because you start out by saying, I want to share. I want to help. I want to support. You're not mm. even really thinking about, I'm going to make a dollar. Right. You're like, hey, just, this is a great idea. And I know people need wheels. So let me see if there's people that need wheels. You know, I got wheels. They need wheels. And it was me thinking, you know, gifts for my friends. What can I do that would make them feel really special? Because my friends to me were very, very special. Yeah. I grew up bullied. So the friends Mm -hmm. I had were very supportive in helping me. My father was. So I kept, I think your root is that you start out going, I want to do something nice for somebody. But what happens is, and you may be that artist who says, I'm going to create a loan. But when you share your heart and your passion, people come on board and that's what happens. You know, I, my mother used to decorate with us every Easter, Easter eggs. And it was the classic where you put stickers on and you peel the stickers off, you know, you do a color and then yeah. you put stickers on and then you do another. With little and metal like, hanger things you like. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, this is so boring. I Can always hate that. Less boring. <laughs> so what did you, did you do? Did you come up with a gingerbread idea for well, it? I went with two colors of the egg, but instead so if you can imagine, you have the first color of the egg, maybe it's like an orange or a fleshy kind of color. And then I dipped it, but I left like a small circle about the size of a quarter on one end. And then I took a pen, a special pen, like today it'd be a Sharpie maybe, and I drew faces on it. So I made these little people eggs. And my mom awesome. goes, well, those are really neat. Let me, my dad said, well, let me take them to work and see if anybody likes them. And they just... They and just sold like so crazy. They sold too. Five bucks a piece. What? The, are you, <laughs> me? you know, my dad says these are the original eggs my daughter does, and everyone's like, "Whoa!" You know? Yeah. And, all that, I did and how old were you? I miss. I was it ten, eleven. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was the thing so after awesome. the, you know, and that's what happened. Things started. My sister need a costume. Okay, what do you want to be? I'll figure it out. And that's that creative thinking. You don't. Yeah. Nothing seems to stop you. So what is that? I'm sure you'll agree. You just think it up and you think everybody thinks it up. Well, and, I didn't realize, well no, they don't. Thing. The crazy thing to me is that, that I'm, I'm sitting here with someone who thinks it up and then somehow acts on it. And that's much more rare. So I, so I want to ask you this. So how did, uh, so you, you're a kid, you're doing these things, you're having a blast. And then I believe your first film that you worked on was Dune. Was that yes. right? And that was, uh, what, what year was that? That, I, oh, that, that, was, that was a minute ago, right? Because I, yeah. I remember like, I remember Doom being like an old movie. Well, well, we can base it on Ghostbusters, which I shot in 82. So I must have okay. did it around 1980. 80, yeah, okay. 1979, 1980. Right. So I'm born in 79. So I remember as a kid going, oh yeah, Dune was that old movie that came out, you know, 10 years ago or whatever. So that sounds about right. Yeah, so 1980. Yeah, about, about then. Yes. And what did you, what did you work on on doing that? That's a, cause it's, it's, it's a classic movie. I'd almost say it's a cult classic. Um, 
And if you haven't seen Dune, I think you should go like stop the podcast, go watch it right now. Uh, it's a, such a, I mean, it might not, you know, keep up with Avengers today, uh, but, uh, but it's just a classic movie. It's, so you, it's, you it's were working great on movie to be my first film, but oh. here I was and uh, I wanted to be an actor. And uh, when I auditioned, people just didn't like the way I looked. I was too light skinned for being a mixed kid and they would say no, no we can't have that on tv so uh they went for my sister mostly who looks african-american or hawaiian mm -hmm. so they went with someone like her first so i kept saying well if i can't act what is the next best thing i can do so sure. i started i was introduced to puppets and i started working with puppets and puppets involve foam so i built with kind of soft foam like you find in your couches and your chair cushions yeah, yeah. So I started to make my own puppets and I kept making my own puppets over and over and over and I was creating these. And you were just and making them for yourself at this point. Just, at this time, just trying to figure out a way I can act where you're not seeing my face because wow. my face was the thing that people were saying is not, sorry, we can't have you on camera. It doesn't work. Wow. So tell me, tell me your heritage then. Cause you said, is, yeah. is it so I'm so, so let me start. Okay. So <laughs> I'm not black. <laughs> I, uh, start somewhere. Start that's somewhere. Being almost 61. Um, <laughs> uh, my dad's black and my mom's white. And the okay. interesting thing about them that I can share is that my parents fell in love at the exact time that Rosa Parks was fighting for her place on the bus. Oh my gosh. So imagine a white what woman a time. looking at a black man and finding love at a time when this just was not done. Yeah. And, and if it was, it meant a lot. Like today, it's just, it is what it is, you know, yes. and, and it's such a beautiful thing that whatever the race is, whatever, but, but you're in a time where everything meant something, right? It was, it, it, it couldn't, even if they just fell in love, it couldn't just be, I don't know why we just fell in love and I don't see anything wrong with it. It, it became, I'm also taking a stand because I'm going to walk out with this person I love of a different color and I'm going to go in public with this person. And, and yeah. it becomes this whole thing, right? That Yeah. And bless my mother. She just didn't see the color. She was engaged to somebody else. She looked at my dad and she said, I forgot my name. Wow. I opened the door. I forgot my name. I forgot. I, I, <laughs> all I could see was this, this handsome ebony man. And wow, I, just story. Could not, I just could not stop. So they get married and they can't get married in the state that they're in. Wow. They have to go to Mexico. And that state was California. Are you kidding? Wow. California, California 1956. Oh, can can yeah. I tell you, like for everyone, I, I say this often, for everyone who thinks the world is getting worse and, and all that stuff politically and whatever you think, I promise you it's getting better. There is so much that's better today. So mm -hmm. many more options, so much more acceptance, so much more today than 50 years ago or, or even 100 years ago. Like it was, it was a little over a hundred yeah. years ago. We like, we got penicillin for goodness sakes, you know, like, like the world has gotten better and I think it's getting better at leaps and bounds. Um, so when you were growing up though, uh, so as a kid, did so you- So it's a wildlife. I'm yeah. light skinned and my hair stuck out in every direction. <laughs> and, <laughs> this is before uh, the dreadlocks. And, and if you look at this on audio, yeah, dreadlocks. You, you can't see Terry's hair, but it's uh, yeah. amazing, beautiful dreadlocks, all different colors, all different lengths. It's awesome. Yeah, just imagine a dandelion. You pretty much have what I looked like as a kid. And, mm. I, and so as a result, one of the things that happened when I was bullied was a kid set my hair on fire in the eighth grade. He just threw a match in it, thought it would be funny. Oh, and my god! luckily, gosh. I had friends that had very fast hands. Now, oh, my goodness. This is not cool. This is not great. This That's is horrendous. a problem. But my father taught me that you have two choices. You can walk around with a chip on your shoulder or you yeah. can look at it with humor and understand try to appreciate people and understand that many of them are just sick yeah and, and just don't know what you can do with a sick person but be a little more forgiving wow and, uh, and that's how what he taught me but you know when i was very young if my dad wanted to take me to a drinking fountain so imagine if you yeah. will and your listeners can do the same that your dad lifts you up to drink at a drinking fountain. And then he sets you down and you go on your way. In my case, my father couldn't do that for me because he was black and I was white. Right. I had to go to the drinking fountain that said white. And he wow. had to go to the drinking fountain that said black. And it just sort of wakes you up a little bit in that back in those days, they could be very blatant. You know, yeah. whereas now... And someone would walk up and say, hey, what are you doing? Where here, like people wouldn't... I mean, not again, like... 
there's still there's still racism there's still things that we're walking through as a culture but so drastically different as far as the blatantness right like yeah, you know exactly. some, no one's going to show up at, at, while you're drinking in a fountain and go what do you think you're doing i can't even exactly. fathom I, I know i mean it was like or or you know ugh, i'm not drinking at that you know stuff like that wow. And my point is not to dwell on the dark sides of things that happened because as a result, my father who saw no color, my mother who saw no color helped me to understand that I need to uh, respect the situation, understand the situation and don't become the situation. Right. So that's what I did. And so here I am just making stuff and making stuff because my mother keeps saying it, whatever you want to do, we'll support you. <laughs> I don't yeah. think she meant quite what happened with me but she because she said they're going oh my goodness what's next you know well i bet you couldn't even fathom whatever you're gonna love will support you even if it's making foam puppets and right like that's well, not even a thing my to, dad comes home do, and i would see, think my dad comes home and he sees fur all over the front room i had just seen star wars and i was gonna make a wookie <laughs> so my dad walks in and says what are you doing and i said i'm making a wookie dad and he's like okay clean up the mess when you're done yeah that's that's <laughs> wonderful dear that is wonderful. How nice. I have Can no I? idea what she's talking about. No. <laughs> well, and before we get, we get too far along, uh, I do just want to say, man, I, I respect you so much um, for just having walked through what you walked through. And, and it's not necessarily more or less than other people that have grown up in the same culture. So I want to acknowledge that too. But for walking through what you walked through, which is certainly difficult, to come out with that attitude of laughing at it to have your father who certainly again i'm sure there were some really interesting and challenging times for him and your mother for for your father to walk out and go hey you gotta laugh at it you gotta love people through it. you have to forgive people um what an incredible gift and and yeah. i can see how it's certainly come through with you and who you are right now um so tell me this though so anyways th that's that i just so want to come continue. back to dune and answer your question yes one of the things that i thought to do and i don't know whoever taught me how to do it was i documented a lot of the things that i did so once i started making costumes for people or myself or i started to create like my wookie for example i yeah. documented it and then i also documented the process so i walk in with my portfolio to some people who are hiring for Dune. A friend had okay. heard about me, seen my stuff. She says, you ought to go over there. And isn't that how it works? You yeah. have a nice, caring person who says, you know, I heard they were hiring over at Blah Blah. I think you'd be great. Why don't you? And you go, okay. And you Yeah, yeah that's how it works there. for everyone, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I guess I'll show there. up. <laughs> that's, how, that's how we all got our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I know you it's were special. So, I so really you, believe this is what people do because I thought it's so simple. Why, why wouldn't it be? So that's where right. I, that's now, where I started you, to learn from, so, from people that it, it, for some it's more difficult. It's awesome. So when it came to going for Dune, right? So you're going to, uh, what is it, applying for a job or going to like a casting call? Or, or what did that look like when you were uh, wanting, trying to get in on the movie? Well, they were looking for someone to build these still suits. And I had read the books dune and really loved the books so i was like well i don't know how they're going to be doing him but i'll take my book down there and i'll go for it and something shifted because i was working in foam mat the foam you find in the couches of yes. seat cushions of your you know house and uh i did that because i didn't have any money so i used foam and created costumes because the material was readily available and it was inexpensive and it was Wait, so, so did you actually take the foam from your couch cushions? Because yeah. I feel like, yeah, like, I would go, <laughs> your I would go parents know. Yeah, I'd go to thrift stores and stuff and buy couch oh. cushions for, you know, like a buck. And then <laughs> you kind of, you know, disinfect them and then you'd cut them up and then you'd make these outfits. I made these crazy outfits. Oh, so, so I'm thinking exactly. the parents are going to come home and see the couch cushions and go, Darry, kids, are you making dude outfits? <laughs> Tell your son, ask you first, Matt. <laughs> yeah, before I come home and all the couch cushions are torn up and cut up and there's a little alien sitting there. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Okay, so, you, so you're getting thrift store couch cushions, you're cutting up the foam, you're making yeah. these still suits for Dune. So did you like start going after just making some on your own? Yeah, I was making Go and show um, them what I made? My, I wanted to do armor, body armor, and I saw that I could do it. I, I don't even remember how I got this idea, but I was making you know, dimensional pieces, um, stuffing them and stuff and making these outfits and then taking pictures of all of that. So Dune comes along and my friend says, go down there. So I go down there 
and they say, well, let's see your portfolio. And they saw my portfolio and they went, oh my goodness, you're a foam sculptor. And I was like, okay. <laughs> did, did, did you say, you know, you say of course I am. Of course yes, that's what I do. Indeed. Will that get me hired? Yes, I am. Um, Whatever and, that is. Yeah. And I thought that in films, when I watched them earlier, that when a, a monster was made, for example, that they used clay and then they took a mold and then they cast it in some way because I had heard from friends that that's the way it was done. Well, in Dune, what they had decided was that foam sculpting was lighter, more flexible and a lot easier to create and didn't cost as much money. So here I opened this portfolio full of exactly what they're looking for. And they were shocked and they said, we're not hiring yet, but we have your name. So um, what would you like to make? And I remember, I mean, per hour? And they said, yeah, what would you like to make per hour? So I did this job for Audi and B&W that I took because of the hours. And what you did was you cut floor mats for, for fancy cars like BMW, Audi, Maserati, and they had the names printed on and then people bought them and put them in their cars. And I got $8 an hour to do that. So Dang. I asked for 10. <laughs> so you asked for 10? Ten dollars an hour to do dune suits, and, and this is so. This is like nineteen eighty ish. So yeah. what, um, or late seventies? How how did that equate? Like, what do you remember? What minimum wage was at the time? Minimum wage was about three dollars and seventy five cents, maybe. Okay, I just wanted to put it in perspective. So, because uh, yeah. when I was working like at, in high school in the mid nineties, it was minimum wage was like four seventy five, and mm -hmm. I had a job at Sizzler making five dollars an hour plus partial tips, which I thought was pretty good. Yes. Um, so if minimum wage is three and change and you're yeah. going for, so you're like almost triple minimum wage, yes. not bad. No. So that, that's the equivalent now of saying, Hey, I want 30, $40 an hour, um, which is not cheap, but not a lot for, you know, working in, in the film industry, I would think. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's how I got on Dune and, uh, wow. they saw that I had an ability. So, uh, they pulled me on certain projects where I had to design, they had a suit that they had designed on Kyle McLaughlin, the lead actor, mm -hmm. but they had other actors that weren't the same shape as Kyle. So I did a lot of work on those suits because I could repurpose the patterns based on what they saw in my portfolio. Wow. So it was cool. It was very cool. So that, that must've been a ton of fun. Now, mm -hmm. what did, did the work on Dune open up like relationships for other, because uh, one of my favorites that I'm so excited to hear about, well, two, a couple of favorites you've worked on, um, but then a couple of years later, you got, you worked on the State Puff Marshmallow Man for Ghostbusters, right? Yes. And, and you did the, I saw you did the Demon Dogs. And so you were, so tell me about the Ghostbusters experience. How did you, how did you find out about them? Um, did they call you? Did you call them? Uh, and, and what was that like to be running the State Puff Marshmallow Man? I mean, that's such an iconic figure, you know? It really is. It really is a wonderful character. And I was working with uh, Bill Bryant, who designed the Marshmallow Man on Dune. And, um, ah. and also there were other, you know, we were kind of a, the way the film industry works is you would kind of float from project to project. When one was done, you'd go to another one. So one of the people would say, hey, they're hiring down in Marina Del Rey on a new film called Ghostbusters. And uh, if you want, I'll throw your hat in the ring. And that's what people would do. And I, yeah, I'd love to go down and check it out. That's so awesome. I went down to Ghostbusters and showed my portfolio to a really amazing young man named Stuart Ziff, who worked on um, Star Wars and also worked on um, Battlestar Galactica. Mm. And he saw my portfolio and he saw a man in there. And he, he, it, there was a man in my portfolio, photos I had documented from Dune that he didn't like. And he said, tell me about that guy. And I said, look, I'm, I'm not going to do that because if you can't say anything nice, you should best not say it. And he said, okay, I'll hire you. If I like you, I'll hire you. So it was the right thing to say. So what so, so you agreed with him saying, I, I don't like that one piece of my portfolio either. Well, <laughs> yeah, but basically the point I really want to make here is yeah. that you want to keep true to your convictions. Mm. which is to try not to say anything bad about, you know, you can't always be perfect. And I'm definitely not, I have no catalytic converter on my mouth at most times, but you want to <laughs> <laughs> guard against, you know, I could have said, yeah, that guy's a jerk if I wanted to say that, but I didn't want to say that I was in an, Oh, I see. 
and I, I didn't feel that was appropriate. But he liked the way that I sort of slid past what he was trying to get me to do. And he asked me if a, a woman would make a temple dog more feminine. And for those of you who ever auditioned for something like this, the answer is always yes. <laughs> oh, okay. See, I would have thought it would be no, of course not. I could do it the Absolutely. same as. Absolutely. If I'm the terror dog, I can make it look exactly like Sigourney Weaver. Now understand I'd never seen the dog. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it was a big, heavy animal. And right, uh, Sigourney Weaver was so young in that movie too. She is adorable. She was adorable. She was very sweet. She was very supportive. And uh, I absolutely adored her, but I got the role because I could make this animal come to life. And he was a very heavy uh, foam rubber cast creature, but I was also a very strong puppeteer. So I just made it happen and they gave me the job. And then the marshmallow came because a few weeks later, Bill Bryant, who designed the marshmallow man needed some people and he remembered me from Dune. And so he pulled me onto the project and uh, I said to him, I said, who's going to be in the suit? And he said, I don't know. And I said, you should shoot for that. It's your character. Why don't you build it to suit you? Wow. And he did. And that allowed him to play the character while I puppeteered the face. So we built the marshmallow man together, him and I and a team of others. And then I also with puppeteering always means team. So we, a group of us manipulated the face, like when he gets hit with the beams from the right. ghostbusters and stuff like that. That's all us making the facial reactions. I remember him, all, him always being so happy. Yes. <laughs> did, <laughs> I, in, in all honesty, do you feel like, did you have any input into that or was that already the creative direction? Because I feel like you bring in the joy you bring. I'm just curious, was that part of kind of, hey, here's how Stay Puft Marshmallow Man is going to be? Or well, was that already like written in? Well, I think it was mostly, uh, it, it was the writers and the creators of Ghostbusters. Mm-hmm. But, but I think it helped that we were joyful in our, you know, we were joyful in our work. And, oh, uh, meaning, you know, Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd was obviously a pleasure. Oh, I was going to ask you about that next. Is you have any interesting run-ins with uh, Bill or Dan? Or I know uh, we, we know Ernie Hudson from being around our friend Craig. He's been around some of our seminars quite a bit. Yeah, uh, who played Bill. Winston? And Ernie. I don't, you know, and I don't know where Harold Ramis ever went. You know, played Egon. He just kind of disappeared a little bit. But I'm just curious. Did you have any interesting stories or run-ins with uh, any of the yeah. Saturday Night Live cast? Yes. Yeah, so, so what happened was I I go to the set and it's my first really big production. Dune was big, but it shot in Mexico. And I just did a little stunt doubling down in Mexico. So I really didn't, I didn't interact with the cast like I did in Ghostbusters. I knew everyone in Ghostbusters and the director Mm. and the producers, and we, we knew, we all knew each other. So I see Bill Murray and I'm crazy about Bill Murray because he did a little film that I'm absolutely in love with called Caddyshack. (laughs) So I run up to him. I run up to him and I go, Bill, it's Bill Murray. Oh, it's such a pleasure to meet you. I loved you in Caddyshack. And he gives me this deadpan look and he says, Caddyshack, are you serious? Caddyshack, really? And I said, yeah, yeah, I love it. It's so great. And he goes, well, what about Saturday Night Live? And I go, oh, I'm really sorry. I don't own a television. I haven't seen Saturday Night Live. I mean, (laughs) Matt, it was insane to say that, but I was honest. And he it said, was you just on that because this is around the, the that was their hey time. Hey, they were on fire. This was the hottest show ever. Yeah, the Chevy Chase and Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray and all these great yeah. guys. Yes. And then, and then they, they, you know, so they're like, what do you mean? You, you, what? So Bill yells for Dan, Dan, get over here. I met someone who lives under a rock. And he says, rock, right in my face, rock, you know. And I'm like, ooh. So he stands next to Dan Aykroyd, which I've always looked at as kind of a, a, a Laurel and Hardy, kind of a Stan Laurel type. I'd character. agree with that, yeah. He was so sweet, but he was very Stan. He was just, I just said, wow, he's a lot like Stan Laurel. So he said, they said, what's going on? You know, Bill Murray says, this girl has not seen Saturday Night Live. I cannot believe that we would have somebody on the Ghostbusters set that has not seen this show. That is just unacceptable. Well, I get really scared and I start to tear up. Oh my gosh. Because I think I'm going to be fired. I really do. Bill was excellent. 
And, and he was uh, just deadpan the whole way, dry. So serious. And he turns to, and Dan Aykroyd looks at me and he notices that I am just barely standing up, that I oh. am shaking. And he puts his, his uh, hand on my shoulder and he says, Terry, no, you think we're going to fire you? No, 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 no. We would never do that. Would we, Bill? And Bill just gives me this look. And he goes, no, no, no. But he says, I have to agree with Bill. You cannot be on the set if you haven't seen Saturday Night Live. And they spin around and they pick me up under my arms so that my feet are kicking. And they walk me to a golf cart, throw me in the golf cart, and take me to a screening room. And no. I free Saturday Night Lives. Now imagine, guys, you haven't <laughs> seen it. You don't know how you're going to react. And you've got <laughs> Bill on one side and Dan on the other. And you're like, please, Lord. Watching please you to make sure that you think they're <laughs> funny. Please let me laugh. <laughs> and and it was good. They showed me um, Samurai Delicatessen. <laughs> they showed me Wild and Crazy Kind of Guys. And then my favorite to date is Landshark. I laughed so hard during Landshark, I, I couldn't breathe. And they, they were properly entertained and I kept my job. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, that is hilarious. Wow. So at this point... So by the time you finish Ghostbusters, do you feel like, are you, is this who you are and what you do yet? Or is this like still like, I can't believe I got these chances, but who knows what'll happen? What, what did it feel like at this point for you? It's, it's kind of like that. Um, I go through any door that looks like an opportunity. Again, I realize people don't do that. So um, I learned from mentors along the way that this is extraordinary. I never thought of myself as this being extraordinary. So that's the other reason I think I, I, I believe I should speak to people because it's just a decision and sometimes it's not an easy one. I have my struggles too, so I'm not, not perfect. I've had several meltdowns, so many can tell you. So at this time when Ghostbusters was done, I just looked around for the next film, but I knew that they were few and far between. That until when you're a beginning actor or performer of any kind, that it's not going to necessarily go one right after the other. So that's when the sculpting came to power as I started sculpting. I said, I sculpt my puppets. So why not just sculpt? So that added something else to the portfolio or the ability now. Well, and I could sell that. So I'd say to people, you know, Hey, I've done these portraits. You want one for the holidays and people would hire me to sketch portraits of them. That put me through college. I also did uh, costumes for what they call today cosplay. Sure. And my winnings allowed people to come to me and ask me to build them, or I would just on Halloween work really hard to have several costumes available, run around through bars and win lots of money um, to help me go through college. Wow. And one, one Halloween season, Halloween was on a Thursday, but they celebrated it through Sunday and I won about seven grand just going and winning contests and putting that away to help me get, get through college. Holy crap. Crazy. So seven grand in a weekend. So you, you were writing, you were making your own costumes, but really intricate, incredible costumes, obviously with your talent and then entering like Halloween contests. Yes. So at I, bars, And clearly you're going to win because I mean, you're making con <laughs> costumes for Dune. I feel like you could probably win, you know, at the San Diego gas lamp district. Well, and the funny thing is that what happened was, there were people like Bill Bryant, who I don't know if he thought to apply his ability, he's another brilliant costume maker, to, you know, the costume costume circuit at bars and things until he saw me win. And, and he would go like, what did you do? And I said, oh, I went to the, this bar and that bar. Now bars are getting a lot smarter. If they have a costume contest, they want you to be one of their regular guests to compete in it. But right. back in my day, you could just, you know, find the list of who was paying what and how they were doing it and then just enter it and, uh, and win yourself some, some money if you did a really good job. So I did Magenta from uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. I did her last gold outfit mm -hmm. and then um, that one. And then I, built an alien from aliens with another guy. And uh, so it was that kind of stuff. I would just do these, these crazy big elaborate things and then carry them in. One, one of my favorite one was Catwoman from the Michelle Pfeiffer Catwoman. Oh, which, which is the best Catwoman. The best Catwoman ever. Michelle's always be the best Catwoman. She had these great nails that retract that she, on the gloves that when she opened her hands, they kind of went like, 
oh, openers and awesome. I did that. I changed my eye color and I worked a mean, I still work a mean whip. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I Fair. went in and they told me, they saw me working the whip outside and they said, you know, when you get into the judges, you can't work the whip in there. And I said, okay. But when I went in, I cracked it over each judge head and then wrapped it around myself like she does in the movie. And that, that sealed the deal. And they were done. They yeah. Were done. Yeah. And, that's and they all I, saw Michelle, Michelle Pfeiffer in their head. I'm going to be her. I'm going to be her. And oh, it was a epic. great costume. It was a fantastic costume and it won. I think that was a $2,500 prize or something. But this is how, you know, when you, when you have this problem and you say, how can I solve it? What can I do? That was yeah. always my question. I want to go to college. And it was just a junior college. It, but that's where I wanted to be. And that's where I wanted to learn. But I had to pay my tuition there. And yeah. uh, it still costs money. Yeah. And yeah. I wasn't the brightest crayon in the box as far as scholastics. But I really was very, very artistic and creative. So I just used creativity to get me where I wanted to go. There was never a second thought about it i just said what can i do to make this happen well it, it sounds like it and can it just switch gears a little bit or, or go into the next yeah. area is now I, I know you you've been you've been a puppeteer for jim henson company and the muppets which is phenomenal uh, for 30 years and you've also been a disney imagineer which one came first the henson thing henson. well kind of they, okay in 82 I built chicken McNuggets for McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> it's your fault. It was foam. They were foam. And it's, so they, they still are. <laughs> foam, Terry, Terry, foam, foam, Terry. And then later they made them, they computer generated them. For years, we actually made these little foam puppets. Oh that my gosh. Insane. No, I literally think they still make those same foam ones. Um, I, think, I think we got them in a Happy Meal the other day. <laughs> at least it take no i haven't had one in a long time <laughs> but it's funny isn't it i mean yeah that's great they, and, you, they, and you did all sorts of things like that you did so you did the foster farms chickens i don't know yes. if anyone remembers the the foster farms commercials they were these like kind of rub i'm sure it was foam and different things but they were foam. Me, yes they were me it looked like rubber chickens driving down the street yes and, well the, well, the, well it, it was foam everything it's funny i think foam because i think the best puppet in the world is your hand the best articulation is always your hand so i always start with my hands hmm. and when i was brought to chickens i didn't want to do mechanical um servos and gears and things i wanted them to be organic and fun and silly and that's what i think of of a puppet that's operated from my hand and then um and then so these kind of things that i would think to do or i would think to build or i was create i would always say well how can i keep them close to my body because they're the best animation. I didn't really have the intelligence to do mechanics anyway. So I said, what do I have that will make it happen? And, uh, and, and that's how, how it just kept occurring. So Jim Henson, all of a sudden I get flown to New York. It's the first time as a young person I experienced first class. I was like, yo, I can see why people like this. Wow. And then I land in New York and I'm doing a chicken McNugget commercial and I get the opportunity to see Jim Henson and I jump at it because his wow. studio is in New York, was in New York. And how, I met How did him. the meeting with Jim Henson happen? Well, my, the person I was working with was an amazing puppeteer who lives here in Los Angeles named Tony Urbano. And Tony Urbano and I would work together well, and then we would have arguments, and then we'd work together well. Just a couple of strong individuals in the same room. And Sometimes, like I said, I would say things that maybe didn't sit well on him and vice versa. But all of a sudden, I find myself us doing this commercial and they have to do it in New York. And Tony wanted to go see the opera and every puppeteer left and I was the only one left. And I said, well, I'll be happy to go to this opera thing, which I've never been to with you, if you'll take me to see Ha, Jim Henson Studios. And he said, well, I don't know if you get to meet Jim. And I said, well, honestly, I'd like to meet Jim, but where I'd really like to go is see how the puppets are made, because I was making puppets. So we went up there, and sure enough, Jim, surprise, was actually there. And uh, wow. he was very impressed to meet me, not because I was Terry Harden, but because I was a woman. And back then, there were only three women to every 30 or 40 men who were puppeteers. So any time wow. a big-time puppeteer, especially Jim Henson, saw that it was a woman, he said, wow, Tony Urbano's a big puppeteer in L.A., 
he's got this girl with him. She's obviously good because he wouldn't hire someone who was average. And he automatically started to talk to me. And then in 89, I had been an Imagineer since 87. So in 89, when he came to Los Angeles to do Muppet 3D Theater, he asked for me. Oh, wow. So he asked for you by name. Yeah. He said, I want to work with, I want to have Terry audition for me. And he told me if I didn't do a good audition, he was going to embarrass me. Because, That's incredible. Yeah. Because I had refused him earlier of coming to New York. I said, no, 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 I don't want to go to New York. And he's like, well, what makes you think you can't, you know, you can work for Jim Henson if you don't work in New York. And Wow. I, several puppeteers who didn't and he was like okay well here's what's funny too what i love hearing that is yet another example another lesson of stick to your guns what you really want to create and do you just go with it right you didn't have to go i'm gonna fly to new york i'm gonna change everything just so i can have this one opportunity you go no i'm gonna keep doing me i'm gonna do what i'm doing and i turned jim henson down i just yeah i i don't want to go to new york and then he comes out well we're gonna do something in la and you need to audition that's amazing it was yeah. insane, really, Matt. I mean, many people are listening. Yeah. Going, what do you mean you said no to Jim Henson? Many people <laughs> thought I was crazy. And but if you're I under 30, Jim Henson, Henson is responsible for the Muppets, for Kermit the Frog. Yeah, hello. Or, what are you? I mean, idiot? everyone <laughs> you've ever seen, Miss Piggy, the, all the big ones, like Jim Henson is the man. Yeah, yeah, how dare you say no to him? And I kind of felt that way a little bit, but I knew I couldn't function well in New York. It was just too, I was very uncomfortable when I was there. Uh, doing the McDonald's thing. And I said, I'm not going to be able to give you my best performance. So I'm going to say no. And I know how crazy this sounds. And so then I went and auditioned and, and, uh, and he was, he was very happy to see. In fact, up until the day he passed, we were working on a, a show that never got produced. He liked my style of puppets because they're very different. And uh, we were working on a show, but then he passed away and we never got to, to see it to the end, but it established me with, you know, the Muppet 3D, and then as you, for the dinosaurs came after that, and established right. that as a hand. And, and this is that, what was it, like early 90s or late 80s mm -hmm. uh, TV show Dinosaurs? It was all puppets? Yeah, Not the Mama, Not the Mama, Not the Mama. Well. Not the Mama, not. I love that show. <laughs> I was like, like I, I watched it religiously. I really did. It was like TGIF. Oh. I watched Full House, Family Matters, Dinosaurs. Like, I loved all those shows then. And I'm like an adolescent, I think, at the time. Yeah. Just phenomenal. And you, and you were on, so... I mean, there's just so much in, in your resume. It just it kind of blows my mind to think about all these, all these pieces of art all through my childhood and my my life growing up that that have impacted me. And, and so many people probably listening, um, you know, between the dinosaurs, between the Muppets, uh, the Flintstones. You're on the Flintstones. Was it the Flintstones movie, right? Movie, both movies. Viva both Rock movies. Vegas and the original with John Goodman. And now, now, I couldn't get, did you play anyone or anything in particular on the Flintstones or were you creating like some of the set work or like what, what would your, what would your um, take on the, on the Flintstones? Well, dinosaurs need, the show dinosaurs went into five seasons and in the fifth season, they were asked to let one puppeteer go and that was me. And at the time, I, I was very sad because the person who told me they were going to let me go failed to tell me that Brian Henson was moving me over to the Flintstones movie. And I said to Brian, well, if you had led with that, you yeah. know. <laughs> hey, we have a promotion for you. You're going to move in the Flintstones movie, but we have to, to end the dinosaurs. Yeah, it was like. That would probably sound better. I mean, it, it wasn't handled the best way it could have been handled, but it was ah. great to hear that I was going to be on this movie. And Brian said it was because a lot of the times on dinosaurs, I, I did baby Sinclair with Kevin and John. Yeah. And, uh, again, puppets mean team and not everything was a high road, but I'm kind of keeping it that way. So you get some hits that are low, but you just, you pick yourself up and you dust yourself off. You sure. cry and say, okay, what next? So with Flintstones, they pulled me on there because I had told Brian during an evaluation that, you know, he, thought I had no ambition, which <laughs> Sound, sounds like it. Did I you, got too snowed. So did you tell um, him what you did at eight years old? Yeah. I said, I have lots of ambition. <laughs> it's just that I like being baby Sinclair. And he said, but you're not the lead. And I said, I don't need to be because baby Sinclair had all these opportunities that other puppets on the show didn't have. So why would I want my own character? That just doesn't make any sense. I told sure. him. And then he said, well, you know, the mechanics, I'll love you because you just work with whatever, mechanisms you have well i wasn't one of the five leads except for baby 
So if I had a background character, I was not yelling at the mechanics to fix stuff that didn't need to be fixed. I would say, you know, uh, rope his mouth together and give me the eyes and I'll just blink the eyes as he crosses through set because he was background. So I'd say, just get it so that we can get through the scene and however you do it, I'm fine. I'll make it work. Just show me, you know? <laughs> and yeah. So Brian said, uh, I'm going to put you on Flintstones because now you get to have premium controls and premium things at your beck and call. And I want to see if what you told me was true. And I think that's the main reason I got it was because he thought I was making an excuse, but I wasn't. Wow. So, so what did you work on on the Flintstones? The, and I want to get into the Disney stuff too, before sure. we're, we're getting close so on I'll time. Keep it short. So I'll keep it short. Basically, uh, I worked on the Mastodon who was the sink. I was the trunk of that. I was on the dinosaur time clock, mostly all the puppets that you see. I was a, a part of those puppets. I forgot the mastodon, the, that, the dinosaur sink. That's right. Yeah, the best the garbage disposal. Disposal pig, the one that gets replaced. Yeah. That. Uh, oh, I that, love that movie. Yeah, uh, Stephen didn't like the look of Dino Steven Spielberg, so he said he was going to come and and see the next performance, which was garbage disposal pig, and we were rehearsing it every day because I was really bad. And all of a sudden it came down that Steven was going to watch and it was going to be our performance, our team. And the person in our team, the weakest link was me, Matt. It was me. And I was scared. And all the Henson people said, it's only our jobs. Good luck. So uh, to keep it short, I did very well, even though Steven was there, the entire cast was there hoping I would, not hoping, but watching to see if I was going to continue, if Henson was going to win or they were going to lose all on my shoulders but we managed to i had a team member um anthony ashbury who kept me laughing and kept me upbeat not worrying so much and we pulled it out we pulled up and did a great job so much that steven let us see uh dailies which he never let anyone see so so we got to do it but but wow it was a terrifying experience and and uh, did dick to bird wings just any puppet you saw in both films i had a hand in something (laughs) <laughs> right. Did, did you end up having any uh, any interactions with Steven Spielberg during the whole film? That was, I mean, obviously he was watching uh, <laughs> with, with your future and destiny in his hands. Um, any random things from catering or or just throughout the throughout the filmmaking? Well, he was doing Schindler's List at the time, and Bryant Levant was actually the director on Flintstones. Oh, okay. He was not really happy of coming to Flintstones from his award winning Schindler's and uh, having to deal with it. So he was not happy, but then once we did our performance, he loved it so much, he reached over my controls and shook my hand. And then he personally took the three of us to watch dailies with us. So oh, that's awesome. you know, it, was, it was a great experience to get to catch his eye like that because you, know, you think at the time you're gonna get more work and uh, I did. Second Flintstones, but <laughs> well, there, there you go. I mean, the best you can hope for is a, is a sequel. You can. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is around the same time. Then uh, you're already working with Disney as well as an Imagineer. Yeah. And for people who don't know, we've probably heard the term, but what is an Imagineer? An Imagineer is something that Walt Disney derived as the people who make the parks magical. I'm not so sure if he used Imagineer when Disneyland was being built, but I'm pretty sure he did. And um, and so what it means is the creme de la creme of artists handpicked by Walt that come together to build the amusement parks that you experience every day of your life. If you go to Disneyland, Disney World, Paris, Disneyland, Tokyo, Disneyland, Hong Kong, Disneyland, or Shanghai. Wow. And I want to talk about Paris, Disneyland pretty quickly too, mm-hmm. but that's, that's coming. Yeah, so I came on Paris, but I never was handpicked by Walt. By that time, Walt had passed. And so I was handpicked uh. by others who looked at my work took a long time but they finally got their act together and hired me and then i worked quite extensively and exclusively when i started on paris now now paris so disneyland paris opened was like 92 yes about that time and and how long after were you working before the opening or was it once it was open you were working on some of the attractions i was hired in 1987 so uh they immediately put me five years before paris even opened yeah, yeah, long time because, and they kept saying it was urgent that we get this park done, that we were behind, we were behind, get going, get going. And and when you're in the movie industry, being behind schedule means it was, you know, due two weeks ago. <laughs> in Disneyland, it meant it was due in nine months to 
24 months out and you were kind of like, Oh, what am I going to do for that? You know, as a, as a movie, as a movie sculptor, uh, I had to pace myself to suit, you know, you have, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to pace yourself to Disney terms and that's a lot slower than the movies and, and it could be a little frustrating, but, but it was a great opportunity. And uh, after I did Big Thunder, Big Thunder is the best one in, in all the Big Thunders because you go, you, mar you board it on the mainland, you go under the water and you come up on an island. So it's mm. a, I didn't design it, but I was really behind it when I heard how it worked. Wow that that sounds epic so you were so you remain because uh, big thunder mountains a huge part of disneyland yeah. and, and obviously i mean you're in la and i and i live in orange county so you know i grew up 15 minutes from disneyland and going you know every five years we'd go um never you know moms nowadays like uh, you know again i told you my son's seven so uh, some of his friends man they'll go, they, when they were like two three years old they'd be going to disneyland three times a week mm. and i'm thinking Jeez Louise, like that was a special yeah. thing. We go every five years, maybe, you know, maybe yeah. every 10 years. Um, but, you know, growing up so close, uh, I always loved, obviously, Space Mountain was probably by far my favorite. Um, Big Thunder Mountain was a huge deal. That was a lot of fun as a kid. Um, so you, you, how much of the work on Big Thunder in Paris did you go into? Obviously, you have engineers you're having to do. Were you doing like the cosmetic work on it? Or did you have creative license to add into how the thing was laid out like what, what was what's the process of working on a attraction like that well with big thunder again you have a team there were two of us actually doing the sculpting of it on a model in glendale california yeah huge team all the both of us yeah yeah all the both of us me and another guy and yeah. um i had a few challenges with that guy and i went to my supervisor and said you know i don't know if this is going to work because this guy and i are not getting along and uh, I'm not giving up, but I, I'm feeling like I want to have words with him behind Disney so that we get it clear where I'm supposed to be. And they were like, no, 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 don't do that. Um, <laughs> sure. So long story short, uh, they told me he was, he was someone that a lot of people had challenges with and that I was so upbeat that if I could make it work out, they would really appreciate it. So I said, I will, but I picked the next attraction. So Big Thunder, we were the rock work division. We made the, the attractions look like they look on the outside. So yep. Splash Mountain, we would be doing that. Uh, Big Thunder Mountain, we had teams that did each one of the rock work pieces based on where they were. And uh, that's what we were doing. My challenge was that when you, but this is a harder foam, my challenge was I would start to do what is called the the busy, dirty work that sculptors don't like to do. And then that allows them to get to the fun stuff. But this guy would then push me aside and do the fun stuff. And I kind of ended up being a bit of a grunt, which I didn't. What a jerk. Yeah. So I just, I just chatted with him and uh, I won't go into detail. We don't have time, but the point was, was we, we got clear. And then the next project I did was Dragon's Lair. And that was all me when I was working on that. I got to design that from the cement wow. up. Yeah, the cave, how the dragon was animated, how the dragon responded, what was going to happen. And that was because I pitched it. I pitched my little heart out because I wanted that dragon so bad. I could that's, that's incredible. Yeah. Well, I, I can't, uh, man, at some point, Tara, I hope maybe we'll have a chance to do a part two on this. Absolutely. Because um, there's absolutely. just, uh, I'm sure we're at no shortage of stories. I, I absolutely love that. Um, I do want to ask though, I know before we started, you said, um, and this sounds really cool. You are doing coming up uh, later in this is 2018. Um, you're doing a retreat for the first time, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, in this September, September 10th to the 14th. You're going to do a retreat unlike anything I've ever heard of before. You're taking people to Paris, and you're going to take them through and walk them through Disneyland Paris, like the VIP treatment to show them. Uh, like, tell me about that because that sounds awesome, and I want to check my calendar to see if it's possible. Uh, well, surprise! Tell me about this retreat you you're doing. That sounds awesome. Well, you know how it is. You that thing that's right in front of you, but it takes someone else to point out you should maybe be doing this. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> you go, hmm, <laughs> that is a good idea. Why didn't I think of it? So someone suggested that there were lots of people who really, really wanted to go on this VIP tour, and they wanted it to be intimate. So I'm only taking. 10 people with me. It's going to be me and 10 people. And at the end of July, July 3rd, we're going to close it. So if it's three, if it's four, if it indeed is 10, 
then whoever it is, we're going. So it gives you a chance to walk with me and have food and learn about the parks for two days. But then I'm also going to show you Paris the way a Disney Imagineer and an artist would view it. And what does that mean? It means that we are going to maybe point out things like your touristy spots like Notre Dame, but I'm also going to introduce you to things that are a lot more interesting about Paris and its people that you may not think about. And that's why I've been there so many times. I've been there five times and I really love the behind the scenes stuff, the play, what you get with the people. So yeah. uh, it's just five days. It's the wow. 10th through the 14th, but it's going to be the opportunity for you to then if you want to make it longer, you can go and do some of these other things that I may not touch on. I may just point at, but my main thing is for you to see Paris the way I see it. That's amazing. Well, and what a great idea too. Someone, an artist, someone as creative as you, obviously Paris is like you know, such a huge capital of the arts uh, globally. Um, I love that idea. And, and honestly, like, like, l- let me be really clear. I like art a lot, mm-hmm. but I'm not, I- I'm not a connoisseur, right? So for me personally, I go like, I, my, my number one thing isn't to go to museums, but, but so many people are going to want to go to museums, art galleries. You know, if I went to Paris, you go to the Louvre and you go to all these great places but for me, the, the biggest draw is to go, to go to a place that I could normally go to, but not, you get to go to the places that you couldn't normally go to at Disneyland, right? You get to go to this Disneyland Paris that you helped to build, right? Yes. Um, and so we get to go behind the scenes and go see how things were made and your stories about it, I'll bet, and, and all sorts of fun stuff. So that sounds awesome. You have me at your elbow. You have me right there for five days to ask me. so cool for me to tell you anything. And there's a very good chance we're not going to go to a lot of museums because yeah. it's one of the things that people, oh, yay, let's go to the Louvre. Well, the Louvre is huge. Sure. And, and it can be very overwhelming. And if we do, uh, we might make a taste of it. But what I really want people to understand is there's uh, Champagne, France, where you can go and taste Champagne, which is like their breakfast drink over there. It's my favorite drink. Sounds but, amazing go to a castle that somebody owns and pet their dog and meet the two people. And they talk to you about their passion, which is wine. And then it carries into champagne. You might turn and talk to somebody about jewelry or making umbrellas or performing. You get to talk to some of these people who have a business that you might not necessarily consider doing as a tourist. Sure. Now, how, how long did you live in Paris when, or in, in France, I guess, uh, when you were working for Disney? Well, they didn't let me go over there because they were concerned about me being a woman and men over there not listening to oh, me. Wh- so where did I you stay? My, my process that I had designed to another man, but I got to pick that man. So I was very happy that I got to choose the person who was going to go over to Paris and build the attraction that I had designed. But that oh, was, you were designing you, so you weren't on site designing. Oh, no, I did it. I did it all in Glendale. Oh my gosh! Yeah. I had no. That's fascinating. So you're designing in Glendale, and then you're uh, choosing the, the guy to go over and actually implement and, and install, essentially, right? Yeah, because Disney said we're really sorry, but we can't send you over there. We need someone who they will follow, and we just don't believe that's going to be a lady. Oh and, my gosh. Again, uh, back to the times. It wasn't being, it wasn't really being chauvinistic. It was that Italian men and women or French men or Italian men and French men, Disney was concerned might not listen to me. I felt they would, but sure. they were looking to get the park built. That Does was that their, sense? I don't need an obstacle, which I could have been. So in or so I, you pick your battles, you pick your battles. And I said, I get to pick the man then because I need him to be true to my design. No, that, that's and, great. Yeah, and, and this makes so going over there and seeing it for the first time like mm-hmm. I did and knowing certain secrets that I know about my work and seeing it, I just burst into tears. I, I spent most of the time when I first saw Dragon's Lair crying because there were so many details that this man was true to. He really did me justice. That's beautiful. And, and, how, and now it makes so much more sense coming full circle that um, you'd want to do a retreat to bring people over because you didn't get to be in the park while you were making things, but yet you're the one designing everything. So now we get to walk through with you and, and experience through your eyes, like your creations, um, and really get that, that backstage pass to, 
to, to get what no one else is going to get if you go to visit that. Not, not only Disneyland in Paris, but also, of course, the entire beautiful country. So that'll be amazing. So one more time, that's September 10th through the 14th. Um, mm-hmm. You are going to do it again, it sounded like. You said you'll do it next year sometime too? Yes. So $700 nice. hold your spot. You can go to uh, terryharden.com or you can, you know, hit me up on Facebook, Google me, you'll find me. Sure. But I'll go through you. But July 3rd is it. And all we ask is that you get your $700 in if you want to go this year. And then if you are interested in next year, you can get your $700 in. And if for some reason I pick a date that doesn't go with you, you can push it to my next date or you can get your, your $700 return. So that's awesome. there's really no obligation. It's just a matter of there's only always going to be 10 because people I discussed said, it's great to do these adventures by Disney, which cost thousands and thousands of dollars. And they have 30 or 40 people and they don't, they're great. But they said the 10 really is what really made them happy because that means they're going to get FaceTime with me and we're going to be, you know, it's like going on a trip and we're buddies as opposed to, you know, a flag. All right, go this way. You know, (laughs) Uh, this is awesome. Terry, I I could talk to you all day long. You are so much fun, such a joy. Um, Again, everyone follow Terry Harden on social media. Um, You'll find her on, I'm sure, Facebook and Instagram and all over the place. Um, I will link in the show notes. uh, So look in the show notes uh, and you'll see a a link to the right webpage so you can find out more about her retreat and and just everything else she's doing. If you want to follow all things Terry and see what's going on, um, you know, maybe we'll get a tour of the dinosaur set one day. I don't know if it still exists, but (laughs) Terry, thank you so much for coming on. You're an absolute pleasure and, uh, and I'll see you real soon, okay? Yeah, and thank you so much. I really appreciate you too. You're welcome. See you soon. Bye. Thank you, Terry. That was such an awesome time. How much fun uh, was that interview? I, I've been doing a lot more interviews lately and I'm really beginning to, to just ha- have a joy and a reverence for the people who are just fun to be around. And Terry is one of those people who, who is so fun to be around. So honored and blessed to have her on the pod. Um, if you want to connect with Terry, make sure you check out the show notes uh, and you can see, you know, her, her website, her social media and anything else you need to know about Terry is right on there and, and what she's up to these days. Uh, great. Definitely follow her on social media and, uh, and have a good time. Uh, make sure you stay up with Terry Harden. So that's it for this week. I trust that you're going to get out there and continue crushing it this week, make your way in business, make your way in life. Um, if I have one last thing I'd want to say to you, it's this right now, expect miracles fast. I believe that this week, and this is just a, a side note for as, as I close, but I believe when I think about this week and what's coming up in, in the near future and seasons is I believe the world is beginning to speed up a bit. And uh, I'm talking about this this Sunday at our church where when we look at good and bad, right, the light and evil, and we look at what's happening out in the world, I think a lot of times we can expect bad things happen instantly sometimes. You know, the other shoe just drops. But sometimes we don't expect good things to happen in a heartbeat instantaneously. So I just want to encourage you this week. I want you to look out and expect good things to happen right away. Expect them to happen instantly. Expect them to happen miraculously. Expect good things to happen and and, and happen very, very fast. So that's what I want you to look for this week. Look for the good things to happen and look for them to happen fast, quickly, and and realize you don't have to wait all the time for it. Don't wait. So speaking of not waiting, don't wait to put in a review. Don't wait to put a rating for this podcast. If you haven't already done that, it helps it a ton. It's, believe it or not, free to do. It should only take you a few seconds. Just go, to, if you're on a podcast app, you can go right down into it and scroll down and hit the the stars that you'd like to give me, which would be great, What however many there are. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Somewhere on the higher end is usually better than the lower end, but totally up to you. It's your authentic experience, but put some stars and then write a review. Um, Even, uh, you know, (laughs) I was going to say even an honest review, but (laughs) what I meant was an honest review is great. But even if there's critiques, positive, negative, anywhere in between, just put your honest review. It it genuinely really helps the podcast. Uh, So I would love if you would do that. I'm sure appreciate it on iTunes. Uh, Make sure you subscribe so you get these downloaded to the device of your choosing every time there's a new episode. We're still coming at you with two episodes a week. And if you haven't already gathered, we're changing over the structure. So I still go on social media live early in the week, Monday, Tuesday or so. 
And then that episode, which is a 15 to 20 minute teaching episode on NLP or general mindfulness or personal development is going to, is going to show up in your inbox Thursday midnight. So Friday morning, you open up your phone, boom, there it is right there. Then sometime th throughout the week, I'll be doing an interview as well. So the week is going to start Monday at midnight. So Tuesday morning, you'll open up your device and boom, there's an interview getting into the origin story of an entrepreneur that you want to hear about. And then on Friday morning, it's going to start your weekend off with uh, a teaching and a nugget on NLP or personal development for you. So two times a week, every single week. Thanks again for subscribing, rating, reviewing, downloading, streaming, whatever you're doing. I love you. I miss you. And I'll see you later in the week. Bye for now.